post it on our Paulding County YouTube page. And that's one of the things I'll send you after the presentation as well as I'll send you a recording of the webinar so you can go back and watch parts of it if there's anything you want to review. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about the Great Georgia Pollen since tonight. So if you haven't already marked your calendar for August 21st and 22nd, that's next Friday and Saturday, um, not tomorrow, Friday and Saturday, but a week from now, Friday and Saturday, um, and you can do it at any time of day that works for you. And the reason that we do it in August is that we're trying to plan for it to be at the start of the school year um, so that teachers and students can be involved. And some of you may be um, educators. So hopefully this will be useful to you. Now my slides aren't moving for me. There we go. So in August 2020, we will come together from across the state for the second annual effort to um, protect our pollinator populations. And anyone who can participate in this initiative, families, school groups, scouts, garden clubs, church groups, just interested individuals, anyone, you do not have to be an expert on insects or an entomologist to participate in this. I'm going to um, show you everything you need to know tonight, and I would encourage you to practice before next week. Um, Participants in the, um, start, the census will be counting insects that land on one favorite pollinator plant for 15 minutes. And the counts will be easily recorded on the project website after you do a little paper count um, at your garden. You can make sure your pollinator garden includes plants that will be blooming next week. Um, hopefully you have some things. This is a great pollinator plant. The picture of this is zinnias. And um, this is what I'll be using for my pollinator census counts. I have zinnias that I put in my vegetable garden at the start of the season, and they're still flowering beautifully, loads of flowers, and there's always butterflies flitting around them. But there are other plants that are great for the census too. Um, this is a partial list of plants that you might find useful uh, and that might be good for using as a plant for your census counts. On the list, um, common ones that you may already have in your landscape include zinnia, hot lip salvia, uh, sedum jo autumn joy sedum, orange cosmos, lantana, black-eyed susan, and cone flower. Um, I have almost every single one of those in my landscape. I don't have a fantastic landscape, confessions of an ag agent, but I do have almost every single one of those and they're all blooming right now in my landscape. So those are all great options. They're not the only options. You could use a flowering shrub if you've got something flowering in your yard. It doesn't have to be um, an herbaceous perennial or annual. You aren't limited to this list. If you have a plant in your garden that you know pollinates nature's flock to you, you can just use it. Um, one that I often hear people talking about that I don't have is mountain mint. And that one's supposed to be just delectable. Pollinators love it. It's always covered with pollinators. So that's a great one to use if you have it. Um, it helps to know what the plant list is. The plant is. It's just, um, just its common name would be helpful when you're reporting your data back to the Great Georgia Pollinator Census webpage. So participants are gonna count insects in several categories. There are eight categories of insects and um, you're gonna be asked to use for your counts. You don't have to be an entomologist to recognize these categories. You just need a little general knowledge of insects. And the, the insects that we're gonna count are carpenter bees, bumblebees, honeybees, small bees, wasps, flies, butterflies, and other insects. So really, most of them are groups of insects that are pretty easily recognizable, and we're going to talk about them and look at some of them tonight. I wanted to start out with a little basic insect anatomy. Insects have three major body regions. Um, their head, their thorax, their head, their thorax, and their abdomen. The head is made up of some fused parts, and it has the eyes on it and some antenna usually and some mouth parts on there. The thorax is the part that has the legs. The six legs of an insect are attached to its thorax. And um, it also has wings. If the insect has wings, they'll be attached to the thorax. Um, an insect's abdomen consists of segments um, without many attachments. Though on some bees, this is where you're gonna find the stinger down at the bottom of this abdomen part. So. Those are the basic parts of every insect. So let's look at our categories in depth based on those descriptors. I want you to feel confident 
about your identification abilities. So we're going to review all eight categories. We're going to start with the carpenter bee. Carpenter bees are the largest bees that we're going to look for. Now, some of you may think of carpenter bees as a nuisance if they've been drilling holes in your wood deck or your wood siding, but they are a really wonderful pollinator. These solitary bees emerge in early spring and then they excavate those tunnels in solid wood and they mate and they provision those nests. Um, they are range in size from 16 to 22 millimeters and they have a black body with yellow and black bands on the upper part. The upper part of their body, the thorax that we talked about of those three parts, that part in the middle, it, that part is covered with hair on these. But the bottom segment, its abdomen, is smooth with no hair, and it's, it's really kind of shiny. You can see that pop abdomen in this picture. Um, these bees have a broad head and a thick body, and you can only identify the difference um, between, excuse me, you can identify the difference between male and female by the color of their face if you get really close. Um, I suspect you're not going to want to get that close to a carpenter bee, although they're not very aggressive. The males have a yellow white coloring on their face and the female faces are totally black. All right, we're also going to look for bumblebees. And this is a yellow bumblebee. Bumblebees are another large bee that serves as an important pollinator that you may see lumbering around your yard. These social bees are especially good pollinators of blueberries and tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. And bumblebees even visit flowers during rainy or cool or windy weather when other bees stay in their nests. They're, they're a very assertive pollinator. Um, they're also pretty large. They're always interesting to watch. They're really fuzzy and they have that black body that is totally covered in yellow and black hair on their thorax and on their abdomen. Um, but their heads are a little smaller than carpenter bees and their bodies really are a little smaller. They do have a large thorax and abdomen compared to a lot of other bees. This photo shows you the difference between a carpenter bee and a bumblebee. We um, kind of like to compare a carpenter bee and call it a Mack truck while a bumblebee is more of a pickup truck in comparison to the, the carpenter bee. So um, I wanna know, before I go any further, I'm gonna do a poll. Um, do, how many of you participated in last year's Great Georgia Pollinator Census? Did you participate in last year's? I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds to answer. And I'll show you the results. There you go. So about 25% of people did and 75% of people are new to that polling. So uh, new to the, the census. So you can see um, where everybody stands and whether they've done a census before. Um, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you about the next picture. Um, so remember a bumblebee has a fuzzy rear while a carpenter bee has a shiny hiney. That makes me laugh, but it does help me remember the difference between the two. So which one of those is pictured here in this picture? Is it a bumblebee or is it a carpenter bee? I'm gonna let you have a little quiz. I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds to answer. Is that a bumblebee or a carpenter bee? Does it have a fuzzy rear or a shiny hiney? All right, awesome. So everybody gets an A plus, you are the gifted class, that is a carpenter bee. And everybody chose the, that it was a carpenter bee. So that's awesome. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
So the next one is honeybees. Honeybees are super duper popular. Everybody loves to think about honeybees. Um, and you know, there's a lot of movement afoot to help honeybees out in our landscapes. During the census, you'll likely find some honeybees using your garden for nectar and pollen. Honeybees will fly miles from their hive looking for flowers. And they are a mid-sized bee, smaller than bumblebees, but larger than some other bees. And they range from 12 to 15 millimeters in size. They're a lot smaller really than a carpenter bee and a good bit smaller than a bumblebee. They have brown or black stripes on their bodies and their abdomens are covered in golden brown hair. They almost look like a little halo of gold when you see them. They're just like a little golden color critter. This photo shows a honeybee and a bumblebee together. And although some bumblebees are smaller, these two types are in easily distinguishable because you can see the bumblebee, not only is it larger, its coloration's much different than that little golden honeybee. So now we're gonna launch into a group of bees that we're just lumping together called the small bees. So while you're counting, you're gonna watch for small bees. Um, most of these are native bees, like orchard bees, and um, some of them are metallic in color, and they're fun to spot in your garden. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think I had noticed them as much until I did the census last year. I mean, I knew they were out there, but now when I go to my garden, I just intentionally look for them because they're kind of fun to see out there. Um, there's leaf cutter bees that gather pollen using hairs on the other underside of their abdomens. Um, and there are bees with bright orange and white, and even green undercoating. So for the census, we're just gonna jump the, lump these bees into one category, small bees. So you don't have to be able to identify one from another, um, but you're gonna know them because they're little. Um, so any bee smaller than a honeybee can include leaf cutter bees or orchard bees or sweat bees. This is a sweat bee in this photo. And they can, um, they keep a lookout for them. They have a metallic sheen of green and the sweat bees are from the family Helictidae. That's one of those scientific names, which you don't have to know for the census. Um, but even though these bees can be small, their metallic color makes them really easy to spot when the sun is shining and you're out doing your census. And you would be amazed how many of them show up on pollinator plants and are out there um, doing the work of pollination. Watch for them. They are small and they are nimble. And as you conduct your census, you may notice more of them than you realized were frequenting your garden. So also, we're going to look for wasps. Now, don't worry. Um, if you calmly watch wasps, they won't be interested in stinging you. Just don't agitate them. They are part of our pollinator complex, and they are super interesting to watch. And typically in my garden, I find they are not at all interested in me. They're much more interested in the flowers and the pollination. Um, I am particularly sensitive to wasps, so I just try to stay away from their nest. That's where they seem to be defensive sometimes. Um, wasps range in size from 13 to 25 millimeters. So that's a pretty large size range. Um, some of them are really big and some of them are kind of small. There are potter wasps and paper wasps and really lots of others. There, are, um, the ones that you find in your garden will have interesting body shapes. They can range from really small to really large and you'll see a lot of different ones. Potter wasps and paper wasps are common and they all have that really skinny, tight, narrow waist. Um, but sometimes you might get a glimpse of something really interesting, like a thread-waisted wasp. And when you see something like that, they're so thin in the middle that you will wonder how their internal organs can even function. And they are so oddly shaped that it's just a really interesting feat of nature to see them. Wasps are generally hairless, um, and almost all of them have really narrow waists. Don't worry about yellow jackets when you're doing the pollinator census. They aren't often seen on flowers. You won't see them as major pollinators during the census. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to talk about is bee mimics or flower flies. Um, they're often found in pollinator habitats and they are actually flies with coloring that resembles the coloring of a bee. Flower flies are not as hairy as bees and they're um, not as efficient at carrying pollen either, but some are really good pollinators despite that. As a comparison between bees and flies, um, you'll see that bees 
normally have four wings and flies will only have two wings. Bees have long prominent antenna, whereas flies have shorter, smaller antenna. The major thing that helps me tell a bee from a fly, especially um, a bee mimic fly, is that bees have two large eyes and then they have three smaller ones in between that are called ocelli. But flies have two just gigantic eyes on their head. Um, and they almost, you know, that's the thing that stands out about a fly to me is those big giant eyes. It's almost cartoonish how big their eyes are. Um, bees carry pollen in pollen baskets. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute. minute. Those pollen bas baskets, the scientific name for them is corbicula. Um, and sometimes they carry them on the bottom of their abdomen um, or called the scopa. Um, whereas flies don't typically carry pollen. And bees are generally hairy, and that's part of what helps them carry pollen. And flies are typically not very hairy or sparsely hairy. You, you won't see it as well with your naked eye. Um, so this is a, a surfed fly. Notice the very small antenna and the eyes are close together with no ocella, and the eyes are giant. Almost looks like he's wearing a pair of sunglasses. Hard to tell if there are two wings or four hooked together. Um, often bees rest with their wings laying flat on their back, um, but I don't see any pollen on that. And so this is definitely a fly that resembles a bee. So it's a bee mimic fly. On this bumblebee, you can see pollen in its pollen basket, like I told you, the corbicula. Um, and you can also see its long antenna sticking out. Know that that is a bee, not a bee mimic. So is this a bee or a fly? I'm gonna throw up a poll and let you tell me which one it is. Is this a bee or a fly in this picture? I'll give you about 15 seconds to answer. end there and everybody gets an A. It is a fly and everybody knew that it was a fly. Good job. All right. Got those big giant eyes that look like sunglasses. It's kind of metallic in color instead of um, being fuzzy. It's just got the two wings. So it's very clearly that's a fly. Oh, and here's the fun stuff, the beautiful stuff that we love to see in our pollinator gardens. Butterflies and moths are common, um, but also unique because they change from a caterpillar to a winged adult through a process called metamorphosis. A typical moth or butterfly begins life as an egg and it's generally laid on a leaf of a host plant in the garden. And the host plant is a plant that provides the food source for the larval stage or the caterpillar. Um, the caterpillar forms and it eats on the plant and then the butterflies, um, you know, the caterpillar metamorphosizes, it gets it turned into um, a chrysalis, spins itself into a chrysalis, and when it opens up, it's a butterfly or a moth. And butterflies pollinate the plants as they take breaks from egg laying to sit on the nectar. So some butterflies that you might be seeing during the um, census activities include um, the ones you see here, the gulf fritillary, the monarch if you're lucky, uh, and the gray hair streak. Um, I feel certain that you'll see a gray fritillary. Um, I also think you're probably likely to see some tiger swallowtails, which are our state butterfly. They're that large yellow and black butterfly. Um, and then the pollinator garden in our office hosts many eastern black swallowtails, which is that large black butterfly with blue markings. It's so pretty. It's almost like a stained glass window on its wings. Um, you'll also see some less flashy butterflies like yellow sulfurs and like this gray hair streak. Um, but nonetheless, they're pretty and they're dainty and they hop around the garden very gracefully. Um, pollinator habitats are also gonna attract some interesting predators. So any insect that doesn't fit into one of those previous categories very easily, we're gonna put in the other insect category. Um, praying mantis and ambush bugs often hang out in the flowers looking to capture an insect or two. 
Parasitic wasps also visit flowers, so you might find them in your pollinator habitat. This benef those beneficial wasps are powerhouses in the vegetable garden as they help control insect pests. Lady beetles might be wondering about to feast on aphids in your garden. Such a pretty little beetle and it's so vicious when it controls those aphids. And then wheel bugs, which are also known as assassin bugs, what a name, um, are usually around in our gardens. They are not aggressive to humans, but they will make lunch of other insects in the garden. They're great predators for pests in the garden. Um, they can bite humans and I hear that it is painful so don't handle these crit critters just let them be. Um, they won't come after you but I've heard of people handling them and get getting bitten by them. So are you worried that you're not going to remember all of these insects that we just reviewed? No fear my friends. Becky Griffin who organizes the Great Georgia Pollinator Census has created an insect counting and identification guide and I'm going to send you a copy of it right after um, this presentation. I'll, I'll email it to everybody who is enrolled in um, the, the class and um, what you'll find is information that will help you with counting. Pictures of all the insects um, and also at the end you'll find the counting guide that you actually need in order to go out into your garden and do your counts. Um, after the, the, the webinar, I'll also send you a link to the Great Georgia web, um, Pollinator Census website where you can find all sorts of great resources beyond just this. But in particular, I went ahead and downloaded this and I'll send it to you. It's a Word document. It's just about maybe 10 pages long, so it's not a big document. Um, if you are working with children and youth, and you want to use the census to teach them about insects and pollinators, there are like a great many resources on the webpage, lesson plans, ideas for implementing the census with kids. There's even kind of a kid friendly count page there if you want to download something like that to use with your own children or grandchildren or if, um, if your kids are doing virtual school, this is a great STEM activity. Um, I would say with this, the census that practice makes perfect and you almost sometimes don't know what your questions are when you're doing something new until you do it. So I would encourage you to get out and um, practice, but I wanted you to see a video that Becky Griffin made that kind of demonstrates how to do the count. Now she did this video about a year ago, but I think it's great. And that way you kind of get to meet Becky for just a minute. She's awesome. And, um, I'm hoping this pulls up for me. It's being slow. Oh wait, here we go. This is the great um, Georgia Pollinator Census Facebook page. And as we wait for this to pull up, I would highly recommend um, that you join this group if um, you're interested in the census. Because um, in the next week, she's going to have lots more great pictures and hints and information about how to um, do your count. Apparently my internet connection has gotten overwhelmed with all the windows I have. Open. There we go. Let's see, here we go. So this is Becky Griffin. She's with the Center for Urban Agriculture. Um, and she is going to talk to you about how to do your counts. I hope if I can get the video to work. Patience you will be rewarded, I think.
Okay. Here we go. All right. So practice makes perfect. Give it a try before next um, Friday and Saturday. You know, get your resources together, get what you need to go out in the garden um, and find a good time of day to give it a try. Um, in my follow-up email, you'll receive the Insect Counting and Identification Guide, which includes the um, data collection sheet. You can also find all of these resources at the website at the great Georgia Pollinator Census.org. It's ggapc.org. Um, and I'll send you that link in the email as well. Um, on the days of the census, you'll be able to go directly to the website to upload your counts. That'll go live on the first day of the census early in the morning. And all of your data will be combined with participants from around the state to help um, us learn about pollinator health and uh, populations all around the state in rural and urban areas, um, in home gardens and on farms and in community gardens and um, urban landscapes and everywhere around the state. You're gonna be part of a historic 